Of course, the Bible is kind of interesting because although it's epic, it's not really a poem like the Iliad. It's not really something coherent. No, no, it's a collection. I mean, Bible comes from the Greek word biblia, which is a plural. So, I mean, literally it means the books. And so there are, depending on who's counting, 26 books in, in, that make up this collection. It's really an anthology. And this is this is not uh, you know any sort of modern revisionism. This is traditional Judaism r- recognizes the same thing. This covers a, a great span of time. The books of the Bible. In fact, the Jews don't really use the word Bible. They use an acronym, don't they, for for three collections. The three yeah the three subdivisions of of the Bible. They call it Tanakh. The T stands for Torah, and the N stands for Nevi'im or the prophets, and the K uh, stands for Ketuvim, or the writings. That's how they divide the, the Bible, those three sub-collections, and then call it, as say, Tanakh. But, I mean, most Jews around the world probably continue to refer to it as the Bible. There's, there's Greek f- fingerprints all over the Bible, not only the word Bible, but in the names of the books. I mean, Genesis isn't a very Hebrew-sounding name, or Exodus, or God help us, Deuteronomy. These are all Greek names that go back to the the first Greek translation of the Bible, which is the, the, the medium that spread that language, was the medium that spread its knowledge all across the Mediterranean. Jews stopped speaking Hebrew, you know, 600, 500 B.C. They had lost Hebrew as a colloquial language and began to speak local dialects, Aramaic in the Middle East, and but all around the Mediterranean, Greek was the lingua franca of most people. And so that, it was that Greek translation that was, had gained primacy of place. And that's why the the books of the Bible have these rather odd-sounding Greek names. Indeed. But originally, of course, uh, God was meant to have been speaking Hebrew. At least that is how the tradition has uh, has imagined it. But that original revelation in which the Bible is first written down, I guess most Jews see as occurring on Mount Sinai, on those two tablets— well, God gave Moses the two tablets, which were a kind of summary of the law. God had a great deal to say on Sinai because it covers from the book of Exodus down to the book of Deuteronomy, which is a lot. And there's a lot of detail in what God said to Moses. But God really began to speak, you know, originally to the first identifiable worshiper of himself in the case of Abraham. Even though going back to Adam, God is present on the scene and talking with the various patriarchs and and like Adam and Noah and others, the focus of the Bible doesn't narrow down until you get to the 12th chapter of Genesis and you get to Abraham. And then it's almost like the the, the early part was some sort of large tracking shot, just follows everybody across the scene. And then when Abraham comes into the story, the focus narrows on him and stays thereafter on Abraham and his descendants. So the main character has entered about the middle of the first act. And it's then that the focus is on Abraham, and then God begins to speak to him in a particular kind of way, which is called the promise or the covenant. And that's sort of the the MacGuffin. That's the device that sets the action of the Bible, to discuss it in those terms, which continues then for the rest of the the books. what, What God gives to Moses is, in effect, the kind of small print of the covenant, the covenant was made to Abraham that you and your descendants will be will multiply as as many as the stars in the heavens or the sands of the sea, and there will be a land for you and your descendants. The two promises that are made to Abraham, and then God requires of Abraham in return that Abraham worship him to the exclusion of other gods. But Abraham had already made that step, and secondly that he and this is the new one that he should circumcise every male in his household on the eighth day starting with himself and, and, and his other contemporaries, and then in the future, every male would have to be circumcised. That's the kind of conditions in his basic terms of the covenant, and that there's more detail to follow. And the detail that follows is then begins to unfold in the book of, for the book of Exodus on. When God begins to speak to Moses, that's when the small print, as I say, of the covenant begins to come down. What's so incredible about that story of God speaking to Moses is that Moses gets these tablets on which he's written the Decalogue, the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, and then he breaks them. Now, right. now that's chutzpah, isn't it? That, yeah, I, I would think so. Uh, I think chutzpah was probably invented by Abraham. 
he was the first one to display that when he, God said, you're going to be the father, uh, it's, it's your descendant, your son. And Abraham, in effect, said, you've got to be kidding. I'm a thousand years old, uh, you know, approximately, and that's not going to happen. And, and my wife here is as old as I am. And they laughed at God. And mm -hmm. I think that's the kind of chutzpah. But uh, Moses, sure, that's that's the kind of... Well, Moses has that kind of attitude about him. He also, I mean, equally... Uh, I don't know what the adjective from chutzpah is, chutzbarak. Equally, chutzbarak is, is when he met God, he asked him his name. And God uh, almost reluctantly tells him, gives him a name, whether it's God's real name or not, who knows. And he said, you know, I am, he called me Yahweh. But then later, Moses asked to see God's face. And God said, no, 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 that's a very bad idea, because if you see my face, you will not live. And so he told Moses to bend down in this cleft of the rock because he was going to pass over. And he did. And Moses, ever the adventuresome, uh, raised his head and saw God's back. So, he, so Moses was a was a kind of daring guy, right, uh, right well, from the get go. There is indeed there is that sense in the in the Bible, and also later on in the parallel tradition that the rabbis developed in the first and second century. I think it started BC. The commentaries and the laws extrapolated from the Bible, which they then mm -hmm. write into the Talmud. There is this sense in which the Jews interrogate their text. They interrogate God, and then later right. on, they interrogate the text. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they continue to interrogate their teachers. See, there's, there's, um, there's an interesting development in that rabbinic tradition about the Scripture, that, in effect, that God has given the Torah to humans, and that, in a way, God has surrendered it, has handed it over for the inquisitorial activities of human beings, and that humans are now sort of on their own trying to puzzle out the Torah, and that, in a way, God has surrendered it to the rabbis. Your book reveals how often the Bible was translated into different <clears throat> languages. There are some variations. But in the end, the Jews do come up with a text that by the 10th century is absolutely consistent. How did mm -hmm. they do that? We really don't know. I mean, I think it probably is due to a very professional and ethical body of scribes. In the ancient world, when people were passing down texts, very often editors, the scribe, the scribal class, what we might call editors, felt uh, perfectly free to sort of improve on the text, to alter it this way or that way. But the Bible seems to have come into a kind of firm state, maybe even first or second century BC. The text seemed to be relatively stable. We now have this evidence from Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, where there are the earliest copies now of biblical texts, and they, they're in remarkable agreement with the, the later 8th and ninth century texts when the editors really have produced a kind of fixed, a fixed version of this thing. But you're right, there is a, there's a great stability in the biblical text, and I, I think it's due to that scribal class that was appointed, who appointed themselves and were, in effect, the caretakers of the text of the Bible. Finally, Frank, can we talk about how long it took from the beginning to the end of writing the Bible? What are the dates that are now accepted as, as sort of the, the origins of beginning to write down this grand collection of books? This has nothing to do with the actual age of the traditions in it. That's a whole separate question. But the beginning of the written tradition, when the thing began to be put down in writing in a fairly consistent way, is probably about the 7th century BCE. And it has to do with the growth of literacy in Israel. And when the society had become sufficiently literate in that literal sense of being able to read and write, that there developed this kind of scribal tradition which began to then transcribe what had been up to that point largely an oral tradition. So the writing of the Bible, first writing down of the collection, is probably the 7th century, or thereabouts. I mean, these are all sort of approximations. As the pace picked up, the pace of literacy picked up, when writing began to intrude more and more into this oral society, more and more of the books were committed to writing.